Crime Obscene is a monthly true crime podcast. Listener discretion is advised. In the late hours of Friday night, down a darkly lit laneway in Glenageary, South Dublin, a voice pierced the September night air, a voice that cried out, leave me alone, go away, and fuck off. These were witness reports of what would soon be determined to be of Raynid Murray in her final moments. Raynid, or Rainy, lovingly called by her friends, had been out in a bar with some friends, after finishing her shift at work. She had spent an hour there before deciding to head home, briefly, to change some clothes as the group were deciding to head to a nightclub. Though a friend had waited and even rang the house phone to see where she was, Raina did not show. Later that night, shortly after 12.30am, as Raina's sister was returning home with some friends of her own, they spotted something unusual in the laneway known locally as the Gap, or more sinisterly as the Cut. There they found, tragically, the lifeless body of the 17-year-old. Raynard had been viciously stabbed four times, and even more heart-wrenchingly, she had died within 20 yards or 18 metres of her home. Evidence later showed, from pools of blood, she had lived on and staggered for some time before succumbing to her wounds. In today's case, we cover Ireland's longest-running active murder investigation in modern Irish history, with more than 9,000 people interviewed, from 12 suspects to no suspects, and a 22-year-old question left unanswered. Who is responsible for the brutal and senseless murder of Raynard? Hello, welcome to Crime Obscene. I'm your host, Aaron. Before we start, I would like to tell you a little bit about this show. Crime Obscene is a monthly true crime podcast that explores unsolved murders, missing persons cases, and beyond. This podcast is run by me and me alone, so your listenership and feedback is greatly appreciated. So why not give me a follow on your favourite podcatcher, or a like and review? This greatly helps out the pod. If you have any feedback, a case suggestion, or just want to drop me a line, you can do so by emailing me at crimeobscenepod at outlook.com, tweet me at crimeobscenepod, or on Instagram by the same name. There is also a Facebook private group where you can discuss your thoughts on episodes, recommend other pods, or just be part of a community who want to make a difference. That's Crime Obscene Investigators. Now, let's begin. Chapter 1. Crime Timeline Raynaud, which is Irish for Rachel, was born the 6th of January, 1982, to parents Deirdre and Jim Murray in Glenageary, South Dublin. Glen Aguirre, which means Glen of Sheep in Irish, is an area in the suburbs of Dunleary. It is a coastal area serviced by a train called the Dublin Area Rapid Transit, or DART. This services popular tourist attractions like Hoth and Bray, beautiful locations in Ireland for both beaches and hill trails like the Bray Head. Notable musicians are from here as well, like singer Sinead O'Connor and My Bloody Valentine drummer Colm O'Quiasic. Alas, Raynard Murray's name would be known across all of Ireland, but all for another, more heart-rending reason. Raynard had an older brother and older sister. Despite being the youngest, Raynard was known to make friends very easily, and upon attending secondary school, she had a group of friends that continued strongly even after moving secondary schools. School testing in Ireland had two standard tests sought by students in their teen years, one of which is the junior certificate, which she performed well on, and then saw her leaving certificate tests, which saw her complete school at the age of 17, 
not uncommon in Ireland, though she did plan to recite her Leaving Cert in order to get higher grades so she could go on to study arts in UCD, the University College of Dublin. Reynard had a massive love for poetry, writing, and hoped to achieve success in her own right as a writer. Friends of Reynard were not the conventional group. Most of them would have been categorised by other people, or normal people quote unquote, as being goth. However, not every one of them would dress in dark clothes, and though Reynard enjoyed expressing herself this way, she did listen to grunge as well, a very popular genre at the time. She would also dress more colourfully, depending on her mood. She was described as highly intelligent, and truth be told, if you had a problem, there was no one better to talk to. Not only being a good listener, she could have her friends laughing at the most mundane things, but just her perspective and mannerisms, where others might not find something funny, she could make it come alive, whilst throwing in a fake snort to push her friends to near hysterics. Being this personable, Reynard was very positive, and was one who could always see the good in the world, in people, and the bright side of things. During her younger years, her and her friends had developed into a tight-knit gang of guys and girls, all who did of course partake in drinking at ages they weren't supposed to, or do things that society might frown upon. But they were by no means hellraisers, or doing extreme things. They just wanted to be left alone to hang around, meet up with one another, talk about their lives, and what it was like to be young in a small country where the older generations were fastidious and would look begrudgingly on them as the youths of their day. Though, as often does happen, with age came maturity, and whilst no big dramatic fights or endings came for the Dunleary crew as they had come to be known, over time they did just drift apart. Like Reynard, who got a part-time job in a boutique, she didn't have as much free time like when they were younger. They would still socialise when they could, going out for days or nights out on the weekend. It was one such weekend that would shatter so many lives and leave the community reeling in its wake. The 3rd of September was a Friday, hot and humid, and like many around Reynard's age, that spelt a few things. The end of the work week and a chance to let their hair down. Reynard had a plan to go into the Dublin city centre that morning to visit the Institute of Education on Leeson Street with the intention of signing up for classes that day. After receiving her first Leaving Cert results, though good, Reynard was unhappy with them and wanted to get better grades so she could get the course she wanted in UCD. But that morning, Reynard had slept in. With the start of her day now off kilter, she chose not to go into the Institute as she would not be able to make her shift in Sally West, which was looming. She instead phoned in from work, informing the Institute that she could not make it, but she was told she could come in the following Monday to sign up for classes. Surely breathing a sigh of relief, knowing that she didn't have to worry about the Institute for the weekend, she went about her day. While at work and during chit chat with her colleagues, Reynard spoke fondly of her father, Jim Murray, and was particularly proud of him as his new promotion to principal at the school he taught had come. In commemoration of this, and for his birthday, Reynard intended to buy her dad an elegant pen with some of her wages the next day. Reynard had an hour long break at four, which she spent with one of her friends, and upon returning to work, Reynard was given the key to the boutique, a big step in her only four weeks of being a part time sales assistant there. It was priorly arranged though that she would be continuing to work when she went into the institute and having the key would mean more flexible hours for working around her studies. Her employers at the boutique did not just hand this key over for this reason alone, but because she was genuinely a good employee with both staff and customers alike, customers often came back to sing praises of the young lady. Deirdre Murray got off early from the national charity where she worked as a psychotherapist to come in to visit her daughter at work too. Her daughter had nudged her to check out some of the sales the boutique would be having that day. Deirdre tried on some clothes whilst having a chance to spend some mother-daughter time with Reynard. Reynard's parting words of, bye mum, I'll see you later, are harrowing as this would be the last time Deirdre saw her daughter alive. CCTV would catch Reynard 
carrying a bag from Sally West, where she was allowed to borrow for the weekend, along with a black shoulder bag, leaving the shopping centre after 9pm. She was wearing a brown jacket with gold lining, dark trousers and black platform boots. After this video footage, witness accounts as to her movements would be heavily relied on to build a picture of what happened that night. Reynard ended up in a bar called Scott's Pub on Georgia Street, Dunleary. There she had met with a female friend, had two drinks, and used that friend's mobile to place two calls. They were organising a bigger get-together at a local nightclub, the Paparazzi. Reynard left Scott's Pub at approximately 11.20pm to go home for a change of clothes and pick up some money. There was an outfit she had bought recently she really wanted to wear. This journey should have taken her about 15 minutes. The route Reynard was supposed to have made home that night was one of speculation for a time. Friends stated she had two routes she would frequently take home, if on foot. One wherein she would go up onto Corrig Road, Lower Glenna Gregory Road, and through a laneway from Silchester Road. The other route was also a laneway that ran along the dart line or the metals. This went from Glastool and up another path to Silchester Road. Both routes led to Silchester Road and ultimately Silchester Park, where she lived. After about an hour and no sign of rain at leisure, a friend called the home phone of the Murray residence, but hung up when Jim Murray answered. An hour of time missing is extremely relevant and unfortunately it may never be known for certain why a journey which normally should have taken 15 minutes stretched to nearly an hour long. Some initial reports were conflicting, stating Reynard may have gone to the nightclub and had not returned home after all. Weather was not a hindrance either, as it was dry that night, warm enough even that Reynard had reportedly taken off her jacket and stuck with wearing her short-sleeved blue top underneath, complementing her distinctive blue nose stud piercing. The first factual account reported seeing Reynard walking alone shortly after 12am, making her way towards Corrig Road, this being roughly halfway home. This time gap is massive, considering she is only now spotted, allegedly, since leaving Scott's at 11.20, she should have roughly been home around 11.35 to 11.40. Why was she only now journeying home? The answer to this question may be of vital importance to explain the violence later that night, or maybe not at all. Following the sighting, and at roughly 12.10am, witnesses who were still sitting in their garden and close to the laneway where the murder took place, reported hearing an argument between a male and female the female voice saying something to the effect of Go away, leave me alone before one final statement Fuck off Then it was followed by a scream The laneway at that time was heavily lined with trees and was not very well lit and despite efforts to make the laneway more open and well lit in the future it does not eliminate the chill of what had occurred that night as at 20 to 1 in the morning Sarah discovered her sister's lifeless body 200 yards or 182 meters from their home. Reynard had suffered multiple stab wounds to the back and side and bled out from 45 meters or 50 yards from where the initial attack took place to where her body was found and sadly she passed away from blood loss and shock even before help had come. Sarah raced home to lure her parents while a friend of Sarah's who was a nurse attended to Reynard, and soon authorities would arrive and take on the immense task and try and make sense of this unprovoked and menacing murder. Chapter 2 Unprovoked, No Motive, No Clues From the onset of investigation, the Garda Síochána, or Gardaí, the Irish police force, was incredibly determined to bring a resolution to this case. Though Dublin, like any other densely populated city, does have its fair share of crime, at the time of Reynard Murray being alive, a murder of this nature was rare. Police who attended the scene were quoted as saying it was, quote, 
the most horrific murder scene of their career, end quote. Due to the savagery of the crime, in a way that looked frenzied and personal, police reckoned that the killer was known to Raynard, and even, perhaps, belonged to a larger group of friends that satellited the Dunleary crew. The types of injuries inflicted upon the young woman were consistent with a butcher or catering knife, though the murder weapon had not been and never has been recovered. Raynard had been stabbed four times in the side, chest and shoulder, but there were up to 30 jabs that had not penetrated the clothing. She was also not sexually assaulted or robbed, building strength to the hypothesis that this was a personal attack. Whilst Gardy theorised the killer was skilled with knives, perhaps a chef, and later chefs in the area would be looked into, the fact that these other multiple stab wounds did not follow through is perplexing. It has led some to think perhaps these jabs were a type of dominative or intimidation technique on the killer's part. It is not known, and may never will be, in what order the fatal wounds came versus the non-penetrative slices. Another avenue that has been speculated upon, and one we will delve into a bit later in this episode, is that perhaps the slices were that of someone with a weaker physical prominence with some saying it could be a female killer, but as we know, people come in all shapes and sizes, and the stature of the murderer is just one more elusive and frustrating detail we are not privy to, as the gender and motive have never been conclusively determined. Raynard's associates, friends and family were questioned, and though understanding that the police had to rule out everyone as a suspect, the Dunleary crew have said they felt they were treated a little more unusual in interviews. It was alleged that police's conduct with them was odd, with name calling, saying nasty things in order to try and get a reaction out of them. This was due in part, at least the crew felt, for their alternative lifestyle choices at the time. It was felt by the crew, in a conservative Catholic country, if you dressed in black and listened to music with distorted guitar, raspy and vulgar lyrics, you of course, had to be up to no good. One close friend of Raynard has spoken out in recent years of their handling during the investigation. As of course they were all young teenagers, already shell-shocked by their trauma, their interviews with Gardy were even more traumatic. To quote what the female friend said in Anonymity, an article that would be listed in the sources, she stated, quote, when they talked about us and Raynard, it seemed they were implying that she was easy with men, and that our lifestyle was sordid, delinquent one, as if that somehow that had a bearing on what had happened, regardless of the fact that it wasn't even remotely true." End quote. This was just one aspect which makes this case seem to have been hampered, rather early on, by oversights on the Guardi's part. From not searching the potential route the murderer could have taken to get away that night, to the mishandling of witnesses in an insensitive way. They were dismissive of a lot of testimonies in ways that seemed like they were just not interested in anything the Dunleary crew had to offer. The Gardaí have addressed these claims in a Garda press office release, stating, quote, Gardaí are not aware of any allegations in relation to persons interviewed. Anyone who has a complaint should contact the Garda Shiakana Ombudsman Commission and report the matter to them." End quote. For international listeners, an ombudsman is an official, usually appointed by the government, who investigates complaints lodged by private citizens against businesses, financial institutions, universities, government departments and other public entities. Despite these conditions and lack of evidence gathering with some of the crew, Gardy had been working some leads. There were witness accounts of a young woman who was present nearby when Raynard's body was discovered. She was described as between 16 to 23 years old, approximately 5 foot and 5 inches tall, with shoulder length hair, and was observed walking away from the scene 15 minutes after Sarah discovered her sister. There was also a bit of ambiguity around one of the friends in the crew, stated as not being really part of the crew, but always there in the background. This was of a young woman who was described as having, quote, violent tendencies, end quote, and outbursts. 
It was also said she bore a resemblance to the young woman seen at the scene at the night of the murder. However, this is highly speculative and in no way has this young woman and that potential witness been linked in any way. And in fact, the potential witness at the scene could have just been a random passerby who was just as shocked by the murder as everybody else and took their leave after a few minutes. A taxi driver came forward with information that about an hour after Raynette's murder, he picked up a young man on the main street of Dunleary, right outside the shopping centre which Rain had worked. This location was also within a distance of all crucial points of interest, such as Scott's Pub and Paparazzi Nightclub. What was more, the young man had appeared to have dark stains on his trousers and an upper portion of his abdomen. The taxi man felt this could have been blood. Originally, the man asked to be brought to an area in Black Rock, but during the journey changed his mind and gave the taxi man a series of bizarre directions which even though grew the journey three times in its length, still wound up in a location of Granville Road, which was a small walk to the occupant's original destination. The young man exited the taxi and went up to this house, and the security lighting came on. The taxi man lost sight of the man, but he had felt the suspicious man was hiding behind some bushes, waiting for him to leave. The witness testimony is of course very tantalising. More probing would reveal an interesting bit of information that some of the crew had told to the Garda. Five weeks before Raynard's murder, July 29, 1999, Raynard was noticed to have danced with a young man in Paparazzi nightclub in the small hours of the morning. The man was also described and a composited sketch was made. He was between 19 and 20 years old, tint average build, 5 foot 8 inches to 6 foot tall, with sandy coloured hair, with a possibility of having blonde streaked spikes and a looped earring on his right ear. He was wearing a cream t-shirt and same coloured combat trousers. The two had left with one another and went to a local fast food chain where they talked at length about music. The unnamed male seemed to know a lot about guitars, particularly of the Fender Sunburst model. This would give the air to those recounting the details he was a student of some type who was local to the area. The crew did not seem to know who this individual was, though some again felt he bore a likeness to another in the extended friends group that satellited the core group of the crew. This other male was reportedly not in the good books of anyone after allegedly sexually assaulting a sleeping young woman in the past. The sandy haired man and this similar looking person have never been formally linked as to be one of the same. But on this night of July 29th, a friend remembered Rain had come in frantically to her flat and wouldn't leave until she could get a taxi from there. The friend got the sense that something bad had happened as Rain had appeared white but would not elaborate on what had happened and only left when the taxi came. The Garda were heavily focusing on finding the young man who had gotten the taxi that night even going as far as saying he was a prime suspect due to the fact he was in the stain closed, seemed to be anxious in the taxi and even seemed to try and confuse the taxi man in his attempts of going around in a big circle and not actually going to his house. The occupants of the house the taxi man originally left the young man at were adamant when questioned that nobody of the description of the young man had lived there. This man differed in appearance to the male Raynet had been seen dancing with five weeks earlier and had brown hair and again a photo fit of this person was put out in media. They had eventually tracked him down, questioned him but never arrested him as there was no evidence to do so. Chapter 3 Summary and Conclusions Throughout researching this case, the sources I have relied on have been thorough and detailed. But of course, there are a lack of names associated with key players in all of this. This is due in part to anonymity. Even potential suspects have not been named. This is a common thread in Irish media and police conduct. As a society with this in mind, bringing you a cogent and as detailed episode as I could possible, there has been some drawbacks. So here, I'm going to go through the three major persons who were mentioned throughout the investigation 
as having a some association with Renard to a point where they were put forward to the Gardaí to look at. I want to preface this with, however, as none of the mentioned people, even though they are nameless, have ever been charged or named as official suspects. In Reynard's case, and as always, all parties are innocent until proven guilty in a court of law. Point 1. The Female Friend This is who, if you remember from earlier, was said to be the quote, violent person that was part of the crew's wider circle of friends. This person was apparently placed in Scotch pub, the same pub that Reynard had been at with a friend for a short while before leaving for home to get changed. Preliminary investigations stated in the first 15 minutes of Reynard's body being discovered, a female of similar descriptions to the aforementioned violent friend was seen in the area then left. The two may not be the same, so to distinguish, I shall describe the second female as, quote, the 15-minute female. Point 2. The 15-minute female is described as being between 16 to 23 years old, approximately 5 foot and 5 inches tall, with shoulder-length hair, and was observed walking away from the scene 15 minutes after Sarah discovered her sister's body. It is not known if she has ever been tracked down, so if you have any information to this person's description, contact for Garda is as follows. Serious Crime Review Team contact. The email is all caps nbclscrt at garda.ie. The Garda Confidential Helpline is 1800 666 111. Crime Stoppers is 1800 250 025. And the Serious Crime Review Team Office is 01 666-3444. Point three is the male seen five weeks before, July 29th, dancing with Reynard in paparazzis, and which purportedly was the same night Reynard went to a friend's apartment shaking and would not leave until she got home safe in a taxi. Male is described as between 19 and 22 years old, thin to average build, between 5 foot 8 inches to six foot tall, with sandy coloured hair, with a possibility of having blonde streak spikes and had a looped earring on his right ear. He was wearing a cream t-shirt and same coloured combat trousers. The two had left with one another and went to a local fast food chain, Abracababra, where they had talked at length about music. The unnamed male seemed to know a lot about guitars, particularly of the Fender Sunburst model. The male was possibly a student living in the Glenageary to Greater Dunleary area. The fourth point is the male picked up by a taxi at the Dunleary shopping centre, which was in the vicinity of notable points of origin in the case for Reynard. The shopping centre, for instance, where she worked, Scott's pub and paparazzi's. This suspect had apparently come from a different nightclub that night. This he stated to the taxi man on his way home. The male had dark stains on his jeans and lower abdomen. He asked to be brought to the Black Rock area, but midway through the journey, he had the taxi man make a series of bizarre turns and take different routes, eventually dropping him at home not believed to be his. The male had been tracked down, questioned, and released without incident in subsequent months of investigation. Point 5. A profile of the murderer. A psychological profile of the murderer has been made. It suggests he is a young man in his mid to late twenties at the time of the murder. He was either single, living alone, or with his mother. He would have likely been a loner with a possible drug problem and may have been at one point in psychiatric care. He has also had said to have had a history of antisocial tendencies and unlikely to have had any intimate relationships. It is also stated there is a likelihood he would kill again. As this is where my research led me, this is where, alas, I must end this episode with a deep sense of frustration for the Murray family. It has been 22 years, an impossible length of time to even fathom having no idea who took your loved one. In closing, I appeal to anyone, any persons in the Dunleary area, if you have information, no matter how trivial or small, Phone it into the Garda. 
Please help a family resolve this living nightmare. They've endured this for over two decades. A murderer is at large who could hurt your loved ones at any point. At 17, Raynard had a whole life ahead of her. She could have been a prolific writer, her pen destined to change the world. It was certainly not meant to be ended suddenly in a laneway by a cold and callous killer. A killer who has had more time of freedom in this country that should have been Raynard's years of growing up and being successful. Again, if you have any information, no matter how small, contact of the Garda is as follows. Serious Crime Review Team. The email is all caps NBCLSCRT at Garda.ie. The Garda confidential line is 1800 666 111. Crime Stoppers is 1800 250 025. And the Serious Crime Review Team office number is 01666 3444.